Hey everyone, welcome to my shop. Thanks for joining me for another patron Q&A where I answer questions submitted by our Patreon supporters. Now if you'd like to support our efforts and have your questions answered right here on the channel, please consider joining our Patreon community. We'll have more information on how you can go about doing so at the end of the video. Right now though, let's get into today's questions. So our first question comes from Lawrence. Lawrence wants to know about mortise, chisel, bevel angles. Um, but before I get talking into all the, the specifics and the techniques about the, uh, about the bevel angle itself, for any of our, our new viewers out there, let's just talk a, take a quick second to talk about the difference between a regular chisel or bench chisel and a mortise chisel. So if you're new to, to handwork, um, you may have heard the term bench chisel or paring chisel or firmer chisel or mortise chisel and not really had a real good idea of what the differences were. So I've got four different chisels laid out on my bench here. So the first one I want to talk about is called a, a firmer chisel. Um, that, that's what we call it now. Um, in old books it's been uh, called a former um, and I think that the term comes from an old French term. Um, I think that's where it got its name from. We call it a firmer chisel. Um, it's an older style chisel that's not really made much more today. Um, but the, the defining characteristics of the firmer chisel is that um, it's got, you know, it's typically straight, although it could be tapered from the bevel to the uh, bolster so that this uh, kind of widens as it gets closer to the bevel. Um, but most of the 19th century ones that we find today are straight, parallel sided. And they're also straight along the sides here. There's no bevels. Um, it's just a, a, the cross section of the steel is just rectangular in cross section. Um, and we call this a, a firmer chisel. Um, and it's one style of bench chisel that you might use. The other style um, is a bevel edge chisel. Um, and you can readily see the difference here in that the bevel edge chisel has its cross section, the corners are kind of knocked off and beveled. And that's to make it easier to get into tight spaces like um, in the area where you might pair the pins of a dovetail. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier to get in there. Um, and most chisels that we're gonna find these days are going to be bevel edge chisels. You'll also notice that there are two different um, ways that these chisels can be attached to the handle. This style here is known as a tang because there's a, a straight um, tapered tang that goes that gets set into a hole in the chisel. That tang is about usually roughly about half the length of the chisel and it's sticking inside a hole in the handle. Whereas this one is is known as a socket chisel because the handle itself, see if I can get this off, the handle itself fits into a socket in the, uh, in the chisel blade itself. Um, yeah, I don't, have a, I don't have one that I can show you the tang readily available. I can't get this one out, but um, suffice it to say what you have is a, a tapered tang that goes into the handle. So that in, in this type of chisel, the chisel fits into the handle and there's a, a bolster, what we call a bolster at the top to keep it from going too far and splitting when you hit that with a hammer. And in this one, the handle goes into the chisel. So it's just two different ways of attaching the handle to the chisel itself. Both of these are known as what we would call bench chisels. They're the chisels that are going to live on your bench and get the most use. Um, the other chisel that's very common in our toolkits is known as a mortise chisel. And you can see the difference here in the cross section of these chisels. Your bench chisels are typically very thin and flat. Um, and that's for the typical work that you're going to do chopping and paring waste. Mortise chisels have a very wide, thick cross section, usually much thicker, much, much deeper in this dimension than they are wide. Whereas your bench chisels are usually much wider in this dimension than they are thick. And the reason that a mortise chisel is um, so thick in this dimension is twofold. First, as we make, um, as we make a mortise, let me see if I can't get one here that we can take a look at. 
So when we when we make a mortise, the we're, we're doing a lot of prying. So as we as we chop that chisel and push that chisel in, it goes into the mortise, and we're prying to get those chips out. If you try to do that with a very thin chisel like this, um, you take a chance of bending that chisel or even breaking it. So mortise chisels are beefed up in that dimension to give you some extra strength. The other reason is that by being so um, deep in this dimension here, it helps guide that chisel straight in the mortise. So you, you, it's very much harder to turn the chisel inside the mortise because of, um, because of this dimension here. Mortise chisels also came in, again, two styles. This would be a tang style, similar to the bench chisel, where the, there's a, a tapered tang that is inserted into a hole that's drilled into the chisel handle itself. And there's a very large bolster here and that bolster allows, uh, it prevents the handle from seating too far and prevents that tang from splitting the handle. This style here, similar to our bench chisel, nope, it's not gonna come out, um, but again, this is a socket mortise chisel. Um, we have a socket and the handle fits into the socket in the chisel. So let's talk for a second about bevel angles because that was Lawrence's actual question. What bevel angle do you put on a mortise chisel? Well, when we talk about bench chisels, usually we're looking at something in the neighborhood of anywhere from 20 to, um, to 30 degrees bevel angle. And that's, the, that's this angle here um, that the bevel of the chisel actually is ground at. And you might vary that for various reasons. Um, you know, for a chisel like this, this is made of A2 steel. If you go much below um, 30 degrees with this type of steel, the edge tends to get brittle and chip. Um, so I keep my A2 chisels ground with a bevel of 30 degrees or higher. And I typically grind at 30 um, and then, you know, maybe add a couple extra degrees when I do the honing. On an old cast steel chisel like this, you don't typically have that problem um, unless the chisel was over hardened. So on a cast steel chisel like this, you can grind a bevel as shallow as 20, 25 degrees and be perfectly fine. And in fact, um, some of my old cast steel chisels, I will grind a bevel as shallow as 20 degrees if I'm only going to use that chisel for pairing because that low bevel angle makes really, really clean pairing cuts and it's a, a wonderful tool. You have a hard time doing that, even with an A2 chisel, um, because the edge just doesn't want to hold up at such a low bevel angle. But with an old cast steel chisel, you can grind a low bevel angle, and as long as you don't pound on that um, chisel too much, you shouldn't have too many problems uh, with edge failure, um, and, and it can be a very fantastic pairing tool. Mortise chisels are a little bit different. These are chisels that you're going to be really pounding on with a mallet. So we typically want to grind this bevel a bit higher. And you'll see, in fact, here, um, this bevel is probably ground at about 35 degrees. I don't, uh, I don't have a protractor handy. Maybe I do. Um, but your mortise chisel is usually going to be... I do have one. So your mortise chisels are usually going to be ground pretty high. Um, so this one... Let's see what we're at here. This chisel is ground, now this is actually a pretty low bevel angle for a mortise chisel. This is ground at about 26 degrees, um, if you can see that there. That's a pretty low grind for uh, a mortise chisel, but there's some benefit in that as well. Most mortise chisels you're going to find are going to be have bevel angles more along the lines of, uh, of about 35 degrees. This one, for example, my honed bevel should be about 35 because I think that's what I typically try to hone it at. Yeah, now this one has um, what I refer to as a two-stage bevel. So if you can see here, the hone on this chisel is actually at about 35 degrees. But there's this much lower section here where the chisel is actually ground, the, the primary grind is at a much lower angle. I believe this is at, these come from the factory at about 20. I can't even really measure because of, um, 
the protractor arms just not long enough. Um, I believe they're factory ground at about 20, maybe 25 degrees. Um, there's some benefit in that. And in fact, if you look at a lot of old mortise chisels in this style, old ones, what you'll often found, find is that the bevel is actually rounded. Um, and I found some, some real advantages to that, um, as well as to the stepped bevel. First, by having a lower primary bevel here and a small secondary bevel, it allows, you to, it allows the chisel to drive much deeper when you're making your mortises. And what that means is that you can make your mortise much quicker because you're removing more material and getting the, chip, the chisel deeper with each pass. The secondary bevel really strengthens up that edge because if you were to grind this at 20 to 25 degrees and be pounding the heck out of it making a mortise, um, it's likely that you would probably break that edge off or chip it or when you were prying actually break the tip off if it was at such a low angle. But by having um, this strong secondary bevel, it really strengthens that edge so that when you're doing all that pounding, it holds its, its edge uh, sufficient enough for quite a long time um, and allows you to pry those chips out without breaking the edge. But there's another benefit, and I think the rounded bevel that we see in a lot of old mortise chisels, actually, um, I think it was done on purpose. I, I'm not so sure that it was just a result of a lazy craftsman getting higher and higher and higher each time he honed his chisel. So what happens if you're using a chisel with a flat bevel, and you use that chisel to make the mortise, and you, um, you chop down with the bevel along the end of the mortise and you go to pry the chips out, the upper part of the chisel creates a fulcrum right on the edge of the mortise and it bruises or damages the end of that mortise. However, if you have a bevel that's rounded, when you go to pry, um, pry that chip out, the rounded portion of the bevel is where the fulcrum is and it creates that fulcrum against the inside end of the mortise so you get less bruising on top. Now in a lot of cases that bruising isn't a big deal um, but if you're if you're making a mortise that doesn't have very large shoulders um, something you know this has got about a quarter inch shoulder on it so that's going to hide pretty well down there and there's going to be a panel here but what about in a situation where you know you might have a very small area um, and you don't have a very large uh, shoulder, you may want to minimize that bruising there. And I think those are the situations where that rounded bevel really helps. And I also think it gives you a little bit more leverage to pry that chip out um, without putting the leverage up here because the leverage is down on the bevel itself. So that rounded bevel really helps. And I think the secondary bevel, that like what I have on this chisel, um, I think it serves a similar purpose because the fulcrum then becomes the, uh, the change, where that change in bevel is between the 35 degree bevel and the, this primary bevel here. So, um, so that's how I sharpen my mortise chisels. I like to use a fairly shallow primary bevel, 20 to 25 degrees, and a fairly steep secondary, secondary bevel, um, about 35 degrees or, or, or so, probably, you know, maybe even a little bit more um, if it's a, a really heavy pounding chisel. You could even go up to 40 degrees. Um, and I think that works the best for me. All right. So our second question came from Hugo. Hugo wanted to, to see a little bit more about the Gramercy saw vise that I've uh, spoken about in previous episodes of the audio podcast. Um, so I do have it here, um, and I will give you a little uh, demonstration of it. I have talked about how it's, it is by far the best vise that I have used. There are other options out there. Um, of course, if you can get your hands on an old Acme saw vise, more power to you. That's probably going to be the best saw vise, period. But for um, us mortals, um, this is probably the most readily available, commercially, uh, currently commercially available style of saw vise, um, and the best of what is currently available. Um, this is based on an old Wentworth style saw vise. Um, it is based on a, an antique cast iron saw vise um, that function in a very similar style. And antique cast iron saw vices can work and can be made to work well. The problem that I find with most of them is that 
Um, a lot of times the jaws don't close parallel, so when you close them up, um, what you'll find is that there'll be a small gap in, the, in this area here, and the, and the jaws won't close evenly. Um, and it's a problem with a lot of old cast iron saw vices, and it's not something that's easy uh, or sometimes even able to be fixed. Um, you can also make your own wooden saw vise. You can get pretty elaborate. There are a lot of plans out there for them, um, and a lot of those work really well. Um, but this, this is my favorite. But before I show you this to you, and I don't have it mounted, so I'm not going to be able to actually file a saw and show you anything, but I do want to show you a very simple way to get started in saw filing if you don't want to invest in a dedicated saw sharpening vise. All you need are two sticks of wood. And if you take those two pieces of wood, um, now in this case, because I'm, I'm showing on a, on a back saw, what I would suggest would be to cut um, cut kind of a, an arc in this, so you could kind of do this kind of shape, something like that, um, and just in this end of these sticks, so that you could slide them over um, over this part of the saw handle. Um, but for this demonstration, I don't think we need to do that. But if you just kind of hold these two sticks on either side of your saw blade, you can clamp this into your bench vise and that is a perfectly ser uh, serviceable method for filing your saws and you don't need a dedicated saw vise. Um, so if you're only going to file a saw once in a while, you really don't want to spend the money on a dedicated saw vise. A couple of scrap sticks, hardwood would probably be even better, I've just grabbed what I had laying around. Um, but perfectly serviceable saw vise just by using a couple of sticks. Now, the Gramercy, like I said, it works. Uh, it, it has the same mechanism as the old Wentworth. So as you turn this this way, um, it closes the jaws. And again, I don't have this um, mounted. I needed to take it off of my saw bench in order to show it to you, but I can try and show you how it works. So. All you have to do is get your saw aligned where you want it. Of course, you want the teeth to be as close to the, um, the top of the jaws without going below them. And you clamp that in. And this is a very, very stable vise for filing. Um, no vibration whatsoever. Uh, a fantastic piece of kit. Um, I bought mine. It was actually a gift to me from my wife for Father's Day, um, from my wife and my daughters, for Father's Day, back when these first came out, and I don't remember the year, um, but I think it, at that time it was about $150 when it was first introduced. Uh, I think they're selling for about $170 now, so the price has gone up a little bit, but um, not terribly, you know, for how uh, how many years the design's been out now. So, um, so. Hugo, there you go. There's the uh, the Gramercy saw vise. Uh, I hope that answers your questions on it. Um, one thing I do like about this, this has a full 14 inch jaw. So if you've got 28 inch hand saws, which is the longest hand saw most of us typically are going to have, um, you can file those hand saws only having to move the saw once. Uh, my hand saws are 24 inches, which is even better. Um, 24, 26 inch saw, same thing. Um, but 14 inch jaws, very stable, very solid, um, very heavy duty, all um, made of mild steel. Um, so definitely a, a wonderful piece of kit um, if you can justify the expense. So our last question for today comes from Scott. And this one might be a little controversial. Not really controversial, but everyone's gonna kind of have their own opinion on this one, I think. So Scott wants to know, and I'm gonna paraphrase his question, but essentially he wants to know how flat is flat enough? Um, lots of things that have been written and read on the internet talk about um, how you can get um, your boards, you know, perfectly flat to within thousands of an inch by hand and, um, Scott kind of wants to know, you know, what, you know, the, the philosophical um, reasoning around it or, or, you know, essentially how flat is flat enough. 
Um, and I, I, you mentioned something about uh, the philosophical, getting too philosophical in your question there, Scott. And um, what I want to stress is that this is really not a philosophical question. Um, it comes down to a question of practicality. It comes down to a question of efficiency, and it comes down to a question of choice. So I've got some examples that I'm going to share. Um, but the first thing that I do want to talk about is the choice factor. You can certainly use your hand planes to get stock as flat or flatter than you can buy machines if it's your choice to do so. And in some cases you may want to do so um, if it's something that really calls for that. Um, that's the choice factor. The other factors, um, you know, so, so it, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. You could do that for every single board, every single piece you ever, uh, ever hand plane, get it, you know, dead flat, as flat as you possibly can. Um, use your feeler gauges and, and, you know, precision straight edges if that's what you want to do. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Then there is the practicality part of it. Wood moves, it's going to move. You may get it perfectly flat one day and come back to your shop the next day and it's not so flat. Maybe it's got a little cup, maybe it's got a little bow, a little moisture change. Uh, maybe you know the day before it was dry and then a storm blew in overnight. You got some humidity, uh, whatever. And the wood moves and it's not flat anymore. You have to d make that decision. Do you reflatten it or do you work with it as is? Um, and that comes down to practicality and efficiency um, and, of course, choice. So let's talk about a couple of examples. So I've got a few here. Um, we talk about how flat is flat enough. When I think about how flat is flat enough, for me, it comes down to how is that board going to be used? I don't have a single canned answer that I'm going to say every board needs to be this flat period. Um, I just don't work that way. So I like to think about it more in terms of how flat does this particular board need to be for the situation that I'm going to use it in. Now in the case of something like a tabletop, you know, we'll use this workbench top as an example. Um, you want your tabletop to appear flat to the eye, but if you put a straight edge on that tabletop after it's done, chances are you're going to see some gaps. You're going to see maybe a little cupping, maybe a little bow. It's not going to be 100% totally flat. In those cases, I like the tabletop to appear flat when I look like it, when I, when I look at it. Now, a workbench top, of course, is going to be a little flatter than your typical dining room table um, or end table or what have you. Um, but the principle is still the same. I get the boards Flat, I will typically get one, one face flat, and it, it is usually going to be pretty flat, um, and get an edge square to that face so that I can glue those two or three boards together to make that wide tabletop. And I'm going to use clamps to align the edges. Um, I might use hand screw clamps where I have a seam between two boards. I might put hand screws on the end of that to keep those two ends aligned. Um, I might put dowels in the center, again, to help with that alignment. Um, you could use biscuits or dominoes or whatever, um, and that could help with alignment. Or even little brads, um, you know, hammer some nails in, clip the heads off, and use those to help keep those boards in alignment. Um, so that's one of the things that I'll do is just to make sure that I can get my seams lined up as best I can when I do that glue up. And that might mean I have to take a mallet and hammer a couple of those, those seams um, to move them once that board is in the clamps to get everything to line up. Um, and then after that panel is glued up, I'll usually smooth it, but I probably won't flatten it again. Um, if it gets way out of flat to the point where I'm not going to be able to pull it flat to the table base that I'm putting it on, or if I do pull it flat to that table base and the top itself is strong enough, the cup or the bow is strong enough to pull the legs off the floor, um, then I'm going to need to address that either by ripping those boards apart and reflattening them, 
um, or using different boards all together to make a different top. But tabletop, I just want it to look flat. Let's talk about another situation. A door panel. Okay, this is this is what I uh, my example door panel. It's like a, a quarter of a door, um, but I use this in a lot of demonstrations and talks that I give. Um, but it's a good visual for this demonstration that we're gonna for for what I want to talk about here. Um, if you look at at this, this panel is not flat. There's some some wobble in that, and it's it's got a little bit of cup, so you can probably see there's a, a slight bit of cup in there, um, and it does not sit flat on the workbench. What is flat are is the frame itself. There's no wobble in the frame. So in this case, what what's important? Where do I need to focus on flat? I need to make sure my rails and styles are flat because this is going into a cabinet. It's going to be set in a frame. Okay, when I open this door, I want it to open correctly. I don't want it to bind. And when I close this door, I don't want the door to sit high at this corner and low at the at the top corner. I want the door to close consistency. So it's it's very important that my frame go together flat. And in order for that to happen, my rails and styles have to be they they can't be cupped. And that's not usually an issue with boards this narrow. You can usually plane that cup out pretty easily if there is any. And they need to be straight along their length. Because you, when you assemble, when you make your joinery and you assemble that door frame, you want that door to sit flat without rocking. The panel, on the other hand, if you can pull that cup out, you'll notice in this situation, I can press that cup out by hand. Well, when I put this panel into a flat door frame, and the frame pulls that cup out of this panel, guess what? Now I have a flat door panel. The panel looks flat. It, it either Maybe it has been pulled perfectly flat by the frame, or it might at least look flat enough in that frame, and the door closes properly. As long as the, the assembled door lays flat, you'll be in good shape. And that usually means your panel could probably have a little bit of cup in it and be okay because the frame is going to allow for that movement and it's going to allow for, it's gonna pull that cup out of the panel. So in this case, this panel doesn't have to be very flat. Um, I can use the joinery to pull that out. What about dovetails? Uh, here's a, a, some half line dovetails. Here's some through dovetails that are, that are at a compound angle. Uh, what about dovetails? Well, dovetails are, are an interesting one because the joint can only go together one way, right? We can only pull, and these are, these are glued so I can't pull this apart, but I can only take the tail board out of the pin board. So what does that mean for this joinery? Well, it means that this board here better be pretty darn flat. You can, if this is, has a cup in it, you can probably clamp it out when you clamp up your piece and maybe the glue will hold it for a while. But if that glue ever fails, that cup is gonna come back. On the other hand, on the pin board side, that board is trapped mechanically by the tails. So you could clamp out a cup in your pin board, assemble and glue that joint, and even if the glue fails, the tails are going to hold this pin board flat. So in a case like this, now obviously when you're, when you're doing precision joinery, you probably want to get the boards as flat as you can. But in a case like this, you could probably get away with a little cup in your pin board as long as your tail board is flat enough to pull that cup out. Um, bow, on the other hand, so, so cup obviously we're talking about across the board this way. Um, bow would be this way along the board. So if you put a straight edge, so you put, we'll use, uh, well, we'll just use this. So if you put a straight edge along here, if you could see light between that straight edge and the board, that's bow. Crook would be along this direction here. If you could put a straight edge along that direction and see light between the board, that board would be crooked. And twist, obviously, 
using winding sticks. You've got high corners here. Um, I showed you with that panel before. That panel probably might have had a little twist, might have had a little cup in it. So um, if you're making a drawer, you probably don't want your drawer front or your drawer sides to have any bow in them. Um, if they do, I would suggest you probably want that bow to be towards the inside of the drawer. If it's towards the outside and your, your drawer sides bow outward, that's going to cause binding issues because you'll get the drawer front nice and tight, but then when you pull the drawer out, as you hit that bow, the drawer is going to bind up. So you probably want your drawer sides to be pretty straight. If not, put that bow on the inside of the drawer. Same thing with crook. You're going to want these sides to be pretty parallel and straight. And again, on narrow boards like you're using for drawers, pretty easy to do. So let me show you one more extreme example, or what I think is a, a fairly extreme example. So what I have here is a, a small cover that I've been working on, on and off, for a few months. And this cupboard has a shelf set in a dado. And when you look at this, when this is assembled, this is really beautiful, nice and flat. But if I were to take this apart, and you can see it's actually not that easy to take apart because the, uh, the joinery is nice and tight. But if I could show you this shelf, what you're going to find is, again, this shelf has a pretty good cup to it. Um, I would say it's probably close to, I don't know, maybe 16th of an inch across its width. Yeah, that's easily a 16th of an inch cup probably across the width of this board. But again, like I mentioned earlier, the shelf is going to be sit, sitting captured inside the dado in the joinery, and the joinery is going to hold that board flat. These case sides, I want them to be fairly flat. If they've got a little bit of cup or a little bit of bow, probably not a good, uh, bad idea, Pro bad idea, probably not a big deal, because, um, again, we're going to assemble this and glue it up, and I'll probably uh, maybe toenail, put some cut nails, toenailed through the bottom of the shelf into the case side to kind of lock everything together mechanically. So again, we can probably pull the cup, if there's any cup in these sideboards, we can probably pull that out um, with some clamps and glue, put a couple nails in to help hold that. Things will still be able to move, but the joinery, again, is going to hold everything nice and flat. So, um, so that's kind of my thought when it comes to how flat is flat enough. Um, Unless I have to have some very precision fit um, drawers, you know, if, you, if you're going to get into building furniture that has these piston fit drawers uh, where you push one drawer out, push one drawer in and the air pressure pushes another drawer out, you're going to need to get your stock pretty darn flat in order to do that. But there's not a whole lot of practical value in doing so because again, as we talked about earlier, wood moves. So drawers that are fit that tight at this point in the year are going to be tighter when the humidity goes up and they may bind and they're going to be looser um, you know at another point in the year when the weather is drier and you know that piston fit isn't going to you're not going to get that push on the other drawers. So um, I, I see that kind of more as a a demonstration of skill, kind of a showing off thing, than I, I really do um, as a practical piece of furniture because you're constantly going to have to be adjusting those drawers until you get to a point where they're no longer piston fit um, and they have room to expand and contract in their openings. So um, for me, as I mentioned, just to sum it all up, how flat is flat enough? It comes down to how the board is going to be used and whether or not I'm going to be trapping that board in some kind of joinery that's going to help hold it flat or whether I need to fit that piece into something else where any out of flat is going to cause problems. So I think ultimately, Scott, if you're of the same type of mindset that I am, what you want to do is think about each board, 
think about what you're going to be using it for, and think about what would happen if this board is not perfectly flat, and how would you address that? Is it trapped in joinery? Is it floating? You know, is it just a tabletop that's not gonna matter? Is it a drawer side where things are, might bind? Or is it a, a door frame where it might not close properly? Think about things more in those terms than how flat does this board necessarily have to be because I don't think every board needs to be taken to the same level of flatness. Um, I think it's, you know, it, it, it goes against being efficient in the shop, um, but that's just the way that I work and everybody's gonna work different and everyone's going to have different priorities. So, of course, everyone's going to have a different opinion on this topic. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you like this video and would like to see more videos like it, please take a minute to click that thumbs up icon, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment below. If you'd like to submit your own questions to be answered here in a future video, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash brfinewoodworking for all the details. Our patrons help us to continue to create quality content like these videos and our bi-weekly audio podcast without subjecting you to annoying sponsorship ads. And as a Patreon supporter, you can submit your own questions to be answered in a future video right here on the channel. So thanks again for watching, and until next time, stay sharp.